Yeah, Kate is a dear friend from Frankfurt School Blockchain Center from DLT Talents, and uh, she's also doing her refi talents right now. She's a mentor, and uh, she's an academic. She's a scientist, and uh, she's also even, I mean, doing projects with the museums and NFTs and uh, digital art. So, yeah. What can I say more about you, Kate? <laughs> you, you move on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Anil. Um, yes, my name is Kate. I am extremely happy to be here today with you to, to listen to your perspective and to share my knowledge. Um, as it was mentioned, I have PhD in quantum physics. So uh, a big part of my professional career, I dedicated to technology and to coding technology, to AI, to quantum technologies. And now there is a second part of my professional life, which is also art. And I'm doing my second PhD in the school of Louvre. In the Louvre, there is a university, actually. So you study it just straightforward inside. Um, and... I try in my professional life combine both sides of my uh, previous scientific and academic career. I combine both uh, arts and technology, and that's why I. It was absolutely natural for me to come to the NFT space because NFT is basically art and technology together. And I have a project. We work with. Uh, museums, we help to gather them funds uh, via the bias of NFT technologies uh, to so they can purchase more art and attract more and more tourists to come. And if we talk about my vision, what is technology in arts and why it's important, because as a historian of art, uh, the this the question of what is medium of art is extremely fascinating for me and the medium of art i mean on what we put art and what we conceive what is art sometimes we think that art is a painting on canvas but it used to be a painting like fresco on walls what is art fresco or painting or it's exactly the same for sculpture because sculptures could be done from marble or from, from iron. And it's same for digital art. It's still art, it's same art, but the medium corresponds to the technological breakthrough of our generation. Yes, thank you. Oh, great introduction, like the evolution of art. Yeah, thanks for that, Kate. And Irem, I, I, I know Irem uh, from also from Istanbul, and he's he's an international, I mean, contemporary and digital artist, and uh, she's an academic. She's doing amazing uh, things. And uh, lastly, I know that she's been working on some VR and AR projects. Yeah, let's see your, some uh, some of your projects and uh, and your background, Irem. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Anil, for uh, this uh, opportunity. Uh, yes, uh, as uh, Anil mentioned, I'm an academic and digital artist, and I live in Istanbul, where I work as assistant professor at Istanbul Bilgi University. Also, I'm coming from the cinema background. I've participated in many group exhibitions, festivals, and workshops in various countries around the world. Uh, my short film here has been selected for uh, the official screening selection of various international uh, film and art festivals. And for three years, I can say that, yeah, for uh, three or four years, I'm interested in XR technologies. And related to this, uh, I'm one of the seven, uh, seven resident artists of Immensiva 2022 by Espronceda Institute uh, of Art and Culture in Barcelona, Spain. And I am one of the mentors of Istanbul XR Art Residency in uh, 2022. Uh, also, in May 2023, I gave uh, gravity sketch workshops as a visiting professor at the Eugenius Gepard Academy of Art and Design in Wroclaw, Poland. Uh, I took place as an artistic coordinator and also, again, gravity sketch workshop mentor at MetaSpark Hackathon and uh, Spark AR Hackathon in Istanbul. Uh, recently, in addition to all these, I can say that recently I took part in uh, some international artistic events such as NFT Biennial, the Wrong Biennial, and Athens Digital Art Festival with my video artworks. Uh, and also, I'm uh, one of the artists of London-based edition digital art platform. I have two collections in there. 
uh, related with all these informations, uh, I actually summarize my artistic statement. Uh, I've always found the collab lives and crises that individuals go through in today's ready lives interesting. And uh, in a society ruled by the patriarchal social order and uh, social screams, maybe we can call it like this, of the suppressed, namely women or different gender identities, are thought to be brought out of bed as um, it's a mean of purification as well as an expression of the inner, uh, their inner world. So in this axis, actually, I try to embody the feelings that are internalized in daily life practices, which also reflects the general views about life. So uh, having used an interdisciplinary approach by using combination of digital drawing, uh, digital painting, video, uh, motion graphics and also XR technologies. I aim to convey the multidimensional character of the human mind. And uh, in that point of view, in my works focusing on gender and identity issues, I explore the representation. Actually, I try to explore the representation phenomenon of feminist art as well. Yeah, I can summarize it like this. Uh, yeah, thank you, Yuri. I'm great. Uh, great work and uh, yeah, very inspirational, I must say. And uh, yeah, dear Kerstin, my my friend, uh, my dear friend from Berlin. I mean, we've been actually participating in different summits and conferences um, in web, about Web3 and blockchain and talking and discussing and fire chatting about art and digital art. Uh, so and the ecosystem. So actually, I'd like to uh, add Kerstin one more question. Not the, uh, not about the, what is art for Kerstin, but especially what's the biggest impact of blockchain and Web three on art and the art ecosystem. In addition to the potential, do you also see boundaries? That's what I'm doing. It just to save some time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell, Anil. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. I have to say I'm very excited to be part of this incredible panel and listening to you all. I mean, this is like a learning curve for oneself, so thank you. Um, my name is Kirsten. I am based in Berlin and I am an art and tech strategist. I'm advising clients from the art ecosystem such as galleries and institutions on topics like digital transformation, business model innovation, but also Web3 related assignments. I am also practicing as an art and tech startup advisor and working together with um, art tech startups who are trying to either evolve an MVP, which is relevant for the art market, or looking for guidance for their go-to-market strategy. And I'm also the co-founder and author of the Art and Tech Report, which is an independent research initiative. And I know we're going to touch upon this later. Um, but we um, already published three editions and we are always out to examine the impact of technology for art and the art market. Um, I'm also a DNT and NFT talent, um, which I share with um, many of you. And I think it's fair to say that you will always find me at the intersection of art and technology because that is what I, what I feel most passionate about, I would say. And... Um, well, um, without skipping the question about art in the digital age, Anil, I just wanted to quickly say that for someone who's rooted in the art market and very passionate about contemporary art, as I, I do, I am, I definitely feel that we are witnessing a very unique moment here in terms of art history with the, um, artists and creators utilizing those new technologies as a creative medium and hence creating completely new forms of art, so I think it will be very exciting to see what is ahead of us. Um, now, with um, the second question you you gifted to me, um, that's a bolder one. If you ask me how I see the biggest impact of the advent of blockchain for art and the art industry, I would probably first and foremost say it's the rise of digital art, um, because thanks to blockchain, and NFT as a technology, it's, you know, it's now possible to own and possess digital assets and because they can be scarce now and of value. And we all know that's been the foundation for digital art. And I'm very excited to see how the acceptance and the appreciation has risen ever since. Although digital art has been around for quite some years, many people say since the 60s. So it's been around, but only now due to digital ownership, it actually gained the appreciation 
um, it deserves and had, has entered the, the art cane and, and the market itself. So I think that is one of the biggest innovation brought by blockchain to the art system. Um, but per <clears throat> I'm sorry, personally, I also think, which is quite an innovation and a clear shift to everything we know so far, at least from a traditional art market point of view, is that blockchain has introduced the redistribution of power back to the side of the artist. Meaning artists nowadays are in such a stronger position now, they can own their data, they can own their work, they can sell it directly without the need or dependency on, on a gatekeeper or a gallery. Um, they can build direct relationships with their collectors, which puts them in a very strong position. And at least in theory, they would also be able to participate in resale royalties on the secondary market, um, which altogether puts them in a very strong position. And I, I think that to me is the biggest shift and change seen by the, the advent or the arrival of blockchain and its opportunities for the art system. Yes, uh, thank you, Kirsten. We know that, I mean, in, we have opportunities, but there are also boundaries. Uh, so I want to yeah. ask this question actually to Esra because she is a creator and, and also, uh, I mean, working and working for the museums, digital art museums, and plus, uh, I mean, she's she's been in different, uh, uh, she's been in wall wing and participating in, uh, I mean, different events and organizations like uh, Samsung Digital Art. So what do you think about the boundaries, Esra? Uh, especially, I mean, improving the Web3 and art ecosystem? Well, the art ecosystem. Um, well, first, I'm totally agree, Kristen. And I do like it something uh, for the potential sites. And then I will explain boundaries. And the first uh, potential is, I think, uh, monetizing digital arts is blockchain based platforms that have emerged, have served the layout of blueprint for how digital works, whether in the form of video, illustration, text, graphics, something like that. And previously, when we opened digital art exhibitions, collectors didn't know how to buy the artworks. And they, and they wanted to buy the artwork they saw on the screen at the exhibition, or they asked how they could display it after buying. So they the, the same process still continue, but collectors are now more informed. <laughs> and additionally, when we they buy uh, the artwork, they they were a bit disappointed when I just sent them a USB or a transfer link because th this is because they had a paid money sometimes paid more money, and when I just sent you know, using <laughs> send the e transfer link. The and they think about the artwork they bought was contained with the link. It's and, and sometimes they said, How oh, is this possible? I paid money and it's just link. Okay. And then when we tell the collectors that they can buy it as an NFT, they are more familiar and if they have a wallet they can buy it. And if not, we can explain how to create one. And then they can make the uh buy it is it is an easy way and and also another one is in uh creating autonomous works of art that that means generative arts uh before um we are exhibited generative art artworks and some systems but the collectors doesn't understand but now it changed and also um i i believe that economy created specifically in the creator, creative sectors, especially in theater and the concerts. And it's very important. It's necessary not to think just not only um, the digital arts technology or digital arts. And boundaries is, um, I think, technology. Technology is sometimes not understand easily. And if Technology understand easily. Sometimes people, you know, um, uh, create a new uh, brick or <laughs> building a new boundaries. And also, um, it's 
um, reflection of contemporary issues sometimes. And I can say, uh, we have, uh, we don't, we, we don't have a big community in the technology side and also NFT side, in especially in Istanbul, in Turkey side, not an international side. And uh, of course, accessibility and the democratization is very important. But in my country, it's not enough to uh, accessibility to in the internet or technology and something like that. And um, Yeah, sometimes in an international side, physical boundaries, it's um, important for my uh, exhibitions. Uh, sometimes artists can create an ex expensive and <laughs> interactive world in the digital space, but um, sometimes experiences that challenge our perceptions of reality. And yeah, I can say that's this one. <laughs> Yeah, actually, we've been also, uh, uh, I mean, curating and exhibiting different exhibitions uh, internationally, and we've been working with the international artists, uh, especially also we support female artists, digital female artists in the field. And uh, so, I mean, different, using different technologies, not just the technology, but the, I mean, uh, the place of the event is very important. And we've been thinking that, okay, uh, the art should be yeah, democratized and not just in the museums. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it could be anywhere and everywhere for the people. I mean, even in your, in your own house, in your room. So that's how actually NFTs and physical art pieces and versus digital art pieces and digital assets, uh, I mean, came into our lives. And my question to Kate first, how can the application of NFTs and smart contracts you think revolutionize the concept of ownership uh, and particularly for the digital art? And is it feasible to extend these technologies to uh, establish and verify ownership of physical art pieces such as paintings by Picasso? So um, what is the difference actually collecting physical or digital art, which Ezra mentioned a little bit, but uh, I'm sure you have some different experiences too. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Anil. That's an amazing question because uh, everyone who collects art uh, wants to collect a real piece of art with a provenance that is actually has a provenance of 100% that it's not as you can call it fake, right? Um, the smart contract um, revolutionized the digital art. The problematic with the digital art was uh, what is digital art? It's something that is on a digital medium. So, for example, um, a JPEG photo or a video could be an art. But how you can prove that it's not, it's not just something copy pasted, right? And that it's not coming straightforward from the artist. The smart contract allows us to put a piece of a code inside of this digital piece of art. And that's how we prove 100% to whom it belonged. And the way we code this smart contract, we actually um, make a track of every ownership and uh, how far it is connected to the artist. So in, in, the such, in, the, in this way, actually, digital art uh, got a new air to breathe with this smart contracting. Uh, obviously, what we want to do now, everyone who works in art uh, is to kind of prolong this effect of uh, verified ownership on physical assets. And that's where the challenge comes, because if we can code something inside of digital art, how can we code it inside of the stature from marble? Um, I know that now there are some companies that exist, they try to put some kind of chip that you can either glue or input inside of the art which is good, but as I can see, it could only prove the ownership for the pieces, for the artists that they actually create. So they basically don't need it. And they have full um, staff working in the museum, like in the Louvre, the conservators of museum, 
they it's actually their job to prove that this specific stature belongs to this specific artist from Italy, from uh, uh, a Renaissance era um, time of Italy. So it's very hard to put it to to this uh, type of pieces and to explain museums that they need it, it's a challenge because at first, everything that you touch in any museum in the world, nothing belongs to the museum. Uh, if this museum belongs to the Minister of Culture, it means that all pieces of art, they actually be belong to the Minister of Culture. And whatever you want to do to these pieces of art, manipulate, restore, uh, and input any chip inside you need to go through the commission and it will be very 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 hard to explain a commission that you need to put a smart contract inside of the stature so once again just to sum up i would say that for digital art it's a real revolution for um conventional physical art that is produced today it could be applied but for everything that was produced 200 years ago uh, the percentage of museums or collectors that would be interested in that is uh, unfortunately very low. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Um, uh, actually, while I was listening to you and Esra's perspective, it's mostly the collector's perspective also, I mean, versus the digital artist's perspective. And uh, yes, we all agree that this is very revolutionary, but I mean, uh, working with Web3 tools and creating uh, with new technologies like AI, AR, VR, XR. So my question is to Vesna and Irem, actually, Vesna, you can start. So how do current non-physical art forms and platforms uh, really enable you to work as an artist, as an inventor? I know uh, you are also an educator, yeah? uh, and maybe you would like to mention some of your latest projects to us. Yeah, Vesna. I think you should. Yeah. Now yes. Now it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, it's it's a really challenging question, also because I think there are so many unknowns, and it's it's really a process that we are still perceiving, as as was mentioned before, also by Kate, uh, as being in flux, and uh, with all these new um, sort of strategies being adopted uh, by public institutions on one hand and and by collectors which i think uh, you know the tools that are given by web3 technologies are actually a, a huge benefit we're, we're kind of moving towards the the cashless society in that sense where things are really transparent and verified so i think that from from that sense it's it's probably um something that uh, at least the way i can see it in my exchange with institutions it's something that is being adopted but it's not being systematically adopted so the question really remains uh, to be seen uh, which is perhaps also important for the artist now practicing today you know to what extent uh, this is really going to uh, become a practice but from the point of view of of uh, an artist i think very often uh i have these conversations with with my colleagues about uh how uh with uh, with this moving away from the traditional gatekeepers as as also Kerstin mentioned before and the tra traditional let's say tastemakers and and in the forms of curating and so on um how the, the entire art production and communication from the uh, uh, between the artists and, and um, let's, let's call them consumers has been in a way liberated or um, has got a whole new potential. Uh, however, there is also a slight challenge because now if everything theoretically is possible, then all of a sudden we see that um, all the available channels are becoming flooded and it's again becoming very important to set perhaps some new types of boundaries, some new types of criteria about taste making. I mean, ev inevitably, art is a very personal, um, uh, you know, a, a matter of personal taste. Uh, and uh, sometimes this personal taste also gets agglomerated um, in, in sort of artistic styles and trends. And somehow I think this sort of filters um, are becoming also implemented. So for me, um, what is also very interesting, I've been looking a little bit uh, in the history of 
artistic production and what sort of challenges uh, traditional media have been facing. And I know from my own sort of uh, early practices, uh, especially in architecture and design, how easy it was to have uh, a design that, ha that has been just published uh, in magazines or in exhibitions, but not fully built or realized how easy it was to, to get that copied and how difficult it was to actually prove, uh, you know, who was the first one that came up with that idea. So, uh, you know, we can say that imitation is the, the most sincere form of, of flattery, uh, but it brings us back to this question of imitation of uh, also artistic forgery, which is, uh, I think, <laughs> Uh, a discipline that has existed as as long as the art probably um and uh with that also uh the need to uh mass produce artworks uh, the need to perhaps also challenge what it means to mass produce and what what it is to to question the validity of um let's say originality and singularity of of an artwork uh, which are also questions that have already been massively addressed by movements such as pop art so this is nothing new um and uh, more recently i think we've been also confronted um if i go a little bit away from the visual arts I mean, the, um, the piracy in the film and music industry has always been a huge problem and uh, downloads, illegal downloading and so on and, and multiplying of this content that actually costs a lot of uh, effort uh, and time to, to create is, is sometimes uh, disheartening. <laughs> so I think that uh, in that sense, um, it is an extra protection uh, and reassurance for the artist to be able to say that uh, working within a digital environment with a set of digital tools um, also is then supported by not only presenting that work in a uh, reasonably, let's say, uh, an environment that is close to their native environment in which the work has been created, uh, but it's also um, sort of seamlessly uh, protected uh, and uh, has a proof of provenance. Um, so I, I believe that, uh, you know, this is still a very, very evolving um, topic and uh, I've personally find it um, beneficial and empowering for the artist uh, to be able to uh, really encrypt and protect and prove the provenance of, of the art. Yeah, thank you, Vesna. And thank you to the, our listeners, actually. I've seen, I mean, many uh, familiar races like Pinar and Atil and Vini and Dominic and Leila, uh, and there were some other participants. Thank you for actually listening to us uh, patiently. Uh, so my question is to Irem as an artist, because uh, I'm feeling like when I talk to some traditional artists and painters, they are kind of feel threatened a little bit about those evolving technologies like AI, AR, and VR to create art. So you think, is there a realistic possibility of AI replacing human painters in the near future? Uh, what do you think? Uh, actually, I'm... Yeah, yeah. Actually, I can say that I'm very optimistic uh, about all these technologies because uh, I think that they are just tools. So still, the human mind, the creation uh, of human being is, is the most essential thing. So that's why I actually uh, don't feel uh, these kind of technologies threatened uh, for uh, painters or traditional artists. But still, I'm uh, working with the digital tools. So that's why uh, I cannot understand maybe uh, exactly what they feel about all these new technologies. Because I think that this world, I mean, the, the world of non-physical art forms and platforms unlocks a vibrant playground for all of us to unleash our potential as an artist or maybe an educator or inventor, etc. So uh, I think that uh, as an artist, we can create 
still just like in the traditional art forms unique visual artworks uh, maybe ai driven narratives but still we create this narrative ai is just a tool that we prefer to use instead of let me say a, a traditional art tools like a brush etc so that's why i think that uh, it's a good thing for us to discover the new possibilities um, expanding our boundaries so climbing up our limitations etc and that's why actually i think that we can explore all the frontiers of these emerging technologies like VR, AR, and again, blockchain and NFTs, because we can reach from all the people around the world. Uh, at the same time, we can meet in the virtual exhibitions, we can tell our uh, artistic point of view, we can transmit our messages to all the uh, interested audiences related to our artworks. So that's why, um, I don't know, maybe uh, you could call me some sort of an, a technology determinist, but uh, yes, I'm very optimistic for that kind of opportunities. Yeah, thanks, Zuram. I'm also, I agree with you. I think all of us, are actually, if we are listening to this panel, so, uh, <laughs> and the speakers, all the speakers are, uh, are totally agree with you, uh, because we need to be also like that. I mean, I'm especially uh, sometimes uh, uh, afraid of, I mean, uh, human <laughs> design technologies other than AI design technologies, let me say. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, sometimes it's true. Uh, and uh, the thing is, uh, my, we've been also, uh, I mean, conducting and uh, curating, organizing, I mean, the first uh, screenless AR NFT exhibitions with my partner, who is also one of the listeners uh, today, until uh, so in different cities and countries. Uh, but now we are working in an AI exhibition project, uh, which is very excited for me. And uh, so we are trying to make it more feasible and visible for, uh, for everyone, actually. Uh, not just for the museums and uh, especially in living spaces. So, um, but um, we need some reports also, and we need some indications, we need some data uh, in those days, how we can really uh, position ourselves as um, in this uh, evolving Web3 technologies, uh, as creators, as inventors, as uh, co collaborators, uh, and also, um, uh, curators uh, and collectors. So, uh, Kerstin, uh, I know that you recently uh, conducted an amazing report, art and tech report, and uh, and there are very interesting indications and insights in that report. Can you just provide us some some important top lines, please? <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Um Yes, um, I would certainly love to, and maybe just to give. A couple of words on the background of this initiative. It's a private, it's an independent initiative. It's been founded by four women from the art market in Germany. And the origin was that, um, at least from the point of view of a traditional art market, there is a lot of hesitation and also skepticism when it comes to opportunities through technology. So um, I, as a strategist, I am always interested in the consumer or let's say collector side um, this, uh, in, instead of you know hearing and listening to what the seller sites would like to maintain or um, not change. So it was always the mission to let the collectors speak about what they do, what they desire, what they plan to do. So all the reports we've been publishing has been asking the collector site as a, as a standard. And for the latest one being published this year, um, the mission was to examine the impact of Web3 onto the concept of collecting and how digital art collecting might differ from the traditional collecting mechanisms we are used to. And we have surveyed more than 300 international art collectors and digital art collectors um, via an online survey. And um, the findings of the, of the latest re research show that, first of all, there are distinct differences between NFTs and collectibles on one side and, and digital art. And they follow different kind of collecting motivations, but also buy, buying patterns. And I strongly believe this is really important to understand because media and the, uh, you know, 
uninformed people still tend to wrap everything in in one bucket, which is not true. So that is one of the most important information in this um, report to really understand how does digital art collecting work, but also how Web3 with its um, concepts is actually putting pressure on traditional mechanism coming from the art market as we know it. And if you force me <laughs> to pick the three most important key insights or learnings, I would probably pick three and a half. And that would be the following. First and foremost, 85% um, of all surveyed respondents said that um, they consider digital art as equally significant as traditional art. And I mean, this is like success and, and gain. And um, this is due to the possibility of digital ownership now. But that also means digital art is seriously nearing and entering the art canon and the market and becomes another category next to painting and sculpture, which is, in my opinion, been long overdue. And also very interesting was to see that the majority of the survey collectors said that the perceived value of their art collection has not suffered at all despite the crypto downwell during the last one and a half years, um, which to us was another proof that there are distinctions. And if you collect digital art, and even if you feel like you're losing in value uh, when it comes to the financial side, there's still an emotional value to art. And that is what remains because it's intrinsic and it's just another proof that digital art follows, you know, the mechanism and and rules and, and a magic of art in itself. And um, and um, as, a, as a third one, and this is actually going back to what Vesna mentioned previously, is that um, we are speaking about Web3 as a concept and we all know it it comes along with core concepts like communities. And when you survey how the power of community is impacting digital art collecting, it's very interesting to see that we literally see a new powerhouse evolving here with a lot of influence in terms of what people collect, how to um, develop an artist career, how to create market demand. So again, I mean, we've, we, we started about uh, speaking about a, a world without gatekeeping, but we can clearly see a rising power amongst communities, literally, um, you know, mirroring those kind of impacts onto the field of art or digital art collecting, at least. And, um, and last but not least, and for someone, you know, very rooted in the traditional art market, this is not really a surprise and very relatable to me, but data shows that collectors and also collectors from the crypto space are starting to ask for more curation and contextualization. And again, in honesty, this goes against concepts like decentralization and democratization. But I'm sure every one of you has experienced the same situation once you visit one of the major platforms. It meanwhile takes a while until you find something you really like or you were looking for because there is a huge oversupply of pictures and you know not necessarily art it's about pictures and you need to find your way around so actually it's only natural that people start to ask for mechanisms like curation or selection or navigation to find their way around um, and, and really start focusing on art again. And I personally think that's a good thing because it's another proof which states we are talking about art here because that is exactly how we treat physical art. We put it into context. We make people see it in real life. Um, so it, it's, you know, we are eventually we are talking about art um, and it doesn't matter if it's sculpture or painting or digital art. And I think that's great. Um, Yes, and if you are interested in more insights, because they are more, we have published the report for free on the website. It's called arttechreport.com. And I know it sounds promotional, but since we don't earn anything with it, I think I'm allowed to do it because this report is meant to be read and shared and traveling and um, should be of interest for everyone who's trying to base decisions, as you said, on, on some kind of data rather than intuition. 
and your journey from the beginning for this art and tech report and, and I was also one of the participants and uh, uh, I I was one of the lucky person actually have seen the report uh, for the first time maybe so I advise anyone actually to have a look, look to go to uh, art and tech report.com and download the report if you are really into I mean uh, web3 and uh, art ecosystem so it's it's very beneficial. Thank you for that. And for the last words, uh, Kate, uh, would you like to add anything? Uh, because we are running out of time, and I'm very, very actually uh, thankful to all our listeners today. Um, I think that everything was told already, but I would just like to, for uh, briefly, for two minutes, take a perspective of the history of art um, on on the subject that AI will replace painters. When we say AI will replace painters, we mean that the painting will be painted in a classic, in the way that we asked it to be painted in a very beautiful way. And it's actually nothing new and we saw it in history. If you take a look on the 19th century, there were two major uh, flows of art in France. One of them was the beloved Impressionism, where actually painters were going against of any rules and they were painting what they liked. And the second flow was, um, as we call it today, the academism uh, flow uh, and academistic uh, painters, and they were painting what were told from them to participate in the exhibition as a salon. So they were not using AI, but they were not using their perfect ideas either. So they were a tool uh, for uh, for the school of arts, for for the royalty, for um, for people who wants to collect. That they, they were painting what was asked from them. So in this sense, AI will still be doing that. But it doesn't mean that uh, creative uh, artists won't uh, have place and won't be creating, and we won't like both uh, creations of that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kate. And uh, for the last words, Esra, what would you like to add? Uh, well, actually, generally, I ask my artists and then just two questions, and then we produce artwork. And my first question is, do you want to use the technology as a tool, or do you want to focus on technology as a center uh, aim in your creation? So uh, when we... Um, when we discuss these two questions, um, we can produce very differently, different way. And yeah, it's yeah, that, that's that, that's all I think. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much for everyone. Uh, I think it was a great discussion, and uh, I'm sorry that we can't record it. So next time, I think we should work on that uh, because we need to share it uh, with many people. And uh, yeah, that's what Crypto Female is uh, really trying to do. To I mean, uh, to do to increase the uh, actually female experts' voice uh, who is working also on the technology and on the Web3 ex uh, ecosystem. And thank you very much to uh, Shilan, Hilal, C. Uh, for organizing this event and to helping me actually uh, for everything made my life very easy uh, for this uh, for this LinkedIn live and uh, yeah see you for the next events then thank you very, thank very much. much for all thank you very much thank you thank you so much thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Yeah, thank you thank you very much